So what I'm about to say right now may not make sense to some of you, but hear me out. Most fans do not care about what your team does in the regular season as long as they win. What they care about is what their team can do in the playoffs, which is where the best of the best show up. You can be a dominant regular team all you want, but if you don't show up in the playoffs, not a lot of people will remember or care honestly. You can even be a mid regular team, but if somehow you show up in the playoffs, everybody will remember. Look at the New York Giants both times they beat the Patriots in 08 in 2012. For these teams, they perfectly fit this description as they were great in the regular season but came up just short or even worse, they didn't come close to winning the Super Bowl. Here are the best NFL teams to not win a Super Bowl, and I don't think you can start off this list without talking about the 2007 New England Patriots. The 2007 New England Patriots will probably be the best team I talk about on this list, and they were an absolute force in 2007, having a roster filled with guys such as Asante Samuel, Wes Welker, Vince Wilfork, Randy Moss, and then of course, Tom Brady. Led by one of the greatest head coaches of all time and Tom Brady, the Patriots went 16-0 in the regular season. They were the number one ranked offense in the league and they also had a top 5 defense as well. This team was essentially dominant all around and they were taking out teams left and right. Ironically, the Patriots only had a few close games that season and one of them being against the New York Giants in week 17 which they barely eked out a 3 point win against that same team which obviously would be ironic later on. The Patriots would end up having 8 Pro Bowlers and 9 Pro Pros on their roster. Bill Belichick would end up winning coach of the year and after a season throwing for over 4,806 yards and 50 touchdowns and 8 interceptions, Tom Brady would be crowned league MVP. In their quest to win the Super Bowl, the Patriots would knock off both the Jaguars and the Chargers in their first two playoff games, and then they would play the Cinderella story, or as in I like to call them, the boogeyman of the NFL, the New York Giants. Nobody gave the Giants a chance going into this game. Everybody thought the Giants were going to get absolutely destroyed by the undefeated New England Patriots. They gave this team no chance at all in this game. But this game ended up being one of the best Super Bowl games of all time for many reasons. With just around 2 minutes and 40 seconds left in the 4th quarter, Tom Brady would connect with Randy Moss for a 6 yard touchdown to take a 14 10 lead. It looked like the Patriots are going to win this game. It looked like they were going to do what the 1972 Dolphins did and have an undefeated regular season or undefeated season altogether. However, thanks to Eli Manning being one of the most clutch players of all time, he would manage to break off a sack from Richard Seymour and connect with David Tyree from one of the greatest catches of all time to set the Giants up in perfect position. Eli Manning would come up huge once again with around 30 seconds left in the fourth quarter. Eli Manning would connect with Plasco Burris for a 13 yard touchdown pass. The New York Giants now took a 17 14 lead. The Patriots would get the ball back and they would have a chance to either take this to overtime or possibly win the game altogether. Tom Brady would throw a bad ball on his first pass attempt. The second time, he would be sacked by Giants rookie defensive tackle Jay Alford. The next play, he would throw a deep ball for Randy Moss. However, it will be broken up by Corey Webster, putting the Giants in prime position to win this game. And that's exactly what the Giants would do. The Giants would not only pull off one of the biggest upsets in NFL history, not in Super Bowl history even, but one of the biggest upsets in North American sports history in my opinion. Nobody gave the Giants a chance. Nobody gave them a chance whatsoever. Everybody thought they were cooked toast. But they ended up winning this game, pulling off one of the greatest upsets of all time and spoiling the Patriots' undefeated regular season. But I guarantee you this made the 1972 Dolphins happy though. But we all know the Patriots would have no problem winning later on though. The 1998 Minnesota Vikings. The 1998 Minnesota Vikings had a stacked roster filled with guys like Randall Cunningham, Chris Carter, John Randall, and of course, one of the greatest shooters of all time in Randy Moss. The Vikings held the top offense in the league that season where Randall Cunningham had over 3,000 passing yards, 34 touchdowns, and 10 interceptions. He also had a solid rush to attack led by Robert Smith who had over 1,000 yards rushing and 6 touchdowns. Randy Moss and Chris Carter on the other hand were an absolutely dynamic receiving core. The duel combined for over 2,324 yards and 29 touchdowns. This offense would even set a record for the most points scored in the season at the time with 556. The Vikings were also a 6th ring defense in the league that season, led by none other than John Randall. 
The Vikings would finish with a 15-1 record, becoming the third team at the time to win 15 games in a regular season, with their only loss coming to the Bucks in a three-point game. As the first seed, the Vikings will obviously get a first-round bye, and then they will play the Cardinals in the divisional round, where they would destroy them in a 20-point game. This now meant that the Vikings were just one win away from capturing their first Super Bowl in their team's history, but only one team stood in their way, the Atlanta Falcons. And honestly, it felt like the Vikings had bad luck in this game because so many things in this game just didn't go their way. Gary Anderson, the Vikings kicker coming into this game, made 122 straight kicks. That also included in the postseason. This guy had not missed a kick since December of 1997. With 2 minutes and 11 seconds left on the clock in the fourth, the Vikings had a chance to take a 10 point lead and essentially seal this game. Anderson would shank the 38 yard kick and it would go wide to the left keeping it to a set point game. Falcons QB Chris Chandler would then lead the Falcons downfield and eventually connect with Terrence Mathis for a 16 yard touchdown to tie the game. The Vikings would have one final chance in regulation to win this game. In the round of 30 second mark, Cunningham would try to lay it out to Randy Moss, but he would not be able to hit him. To start overtime, the Vikings would get the ball, however, they would punt in their first possession, and then they would manage to stop the Falcons on their second possession. They got the ball back for the second time in overtime. Cunningham would try to hit Randy Moss deep, however, Eugene Robinson would come around back and break it up, forcing once again the Vikings to punt the ball. The Falcons would drive downfield and eventually set up a game-winning field goal to upset the Vikings. The Vikings would make the title game four times after this and twice in internet blowouts and close losses. Specifically, two years after this, we lost to the New York Giants 41-0. Vikings made the NFT Championship game and also in 2009 and 2017, but once again, they would not win either of those games. The Vikings have had some talented teams over the last couple years, but unfortunately, they have not been enough to make it to the Super Bowl and obviously win one. The 1990 49ers the 49ers could probably be only here a couple times, but the 1990 team was the one that won the contest here. And I think we all know who the 49ers were led by. Joe Montana, Ronnie Lott, and one of the greatest receivers of all time, Jerry Rice. For this, the 49ers had just won two straight Super Bowls, destroying the Broncos in Super Bowl 24, 55 to 10, and beating the Bengals in a tight game in Super Bowl 23. The 49ers looking to become the second team in NFL history since the Green Bay Packers to three-peat. The Packers did this from 1929 to 1931, and they also did it from 1965 to 1967. 49ers will go 14-2 in the regular season with their number two ranked defense, and they're also number two ranked offense. Their own loss came from the Saints in a three-point game in the Rams in Week 12. Ironically, one of the close losses for the 49ers came in Week 13 against the New York Giants in a defensive showdown where the New York Giants would only score three points and the 49ers only score one touchdown and the game ended in a 73 game. Joe Montana would be the MVP that season and Jerry Rice would lead the league in pretty much every stat there was for a receiver, having 100 receptions for over 1,502 yards and 13 touchdowns. Their defense is led by Charles Haley, who has 16 sacks, and of course, one of the best defensive backs of all time, Ronnie Lott. As the first seed, they would get a first round bye, and then they would play the Redskins in the divisional round, where they won that game 28-10. They would then face the boogeyman of the NFL, you know who I'm talking about, the New York Giants, and this game was once again another defensive battle, just like their matchup in the regular season. The 49ers will only get one touchdown in that game, and the Giants wouldn't get a single touchdown, because they got all their points by way of field goals. However, that would be enough for them to win the game as Giants kicker Matt Briar would kick the game winning field goal as time expired, pulling off one of the biggest upsets once again in playoff history, obviously way before they would beat the Patriots in Super Bowl 42. Fortunately for the 49ers, they would miss the playoffs the next two years after Joe Montana would miss the entire season with an elbow injury, and they would get back to the conference championship game eventually, however, they would lose to the Cowboys both times. Unfortunately for the 49ers though, Heartbreak has kind of been the story for them over the last couple of decades. They get so close to making the Super Bowl, and then even if they do make the Super Bowl, unfortunately, they come up just short. 2019 Baltimore Ravens. The 2019 Baltimore Ravens finished the regular season with a 14-2 record, the best in the NFL that year, and also in franchise history. 
There's obviously secured them an AFC North title and obviously the top seed in the AFC playoffs. This offense under Jim Harbaugh was absolutely one of the best strategies I've ever seen and they also had a very stingy defense. One of the big reasons for this offense being so successful was their rushing attack as they set an NFL record 3,296 rushing yards surpassing the 1978 New England Patriots. This offense had everything power running, option football, and efficient passing. This made the Ravens absolutely dominant this season. But we will be mistaken if we didn't talk about the key of this whole offense, Lamar Jackson, who had 36 touchdown passes, and he rushed the ball for 1,206 yards, breaking Michael Vick's single season record for a quarterback. Jackson's dual threat capability earned him the NFL MVP, making him the second youngest player to win the honor. Jackson was supported by a robust offensive line featuring Marshall Yonda and also all pro tackle Ronnie Stanley. Not to mention Mark Ingram was also a big part of that rushing attack as well, and this only made them even more dominant. Defensively though, the Ravens ranked top 5 that year in both points allowed and yards allowed, and key contributions come from guys like Earl Thomas, Marlon Humphrey, Marcus Peters, and Matthew Judon. The Ravens were dominant all around, and this earned them obviously like I said before, a first round bye, which means in a divisional round, they would end up meeting the Tennessee Titans in that game. Unfortunately, the Ravens quickly fell back down to earth in this game. Remember, coming into this game, the Ravens defense was essentially top five in every category. In this game though, they didn't look like it as Derrick Henry rushed for 195 yards in this game, dominating this Ravens defensive line and defense altogether, even embarrassing Earl Thomas in this game. Like, look at this. Not only was the Ravens defense a problem, but they failed on critical fourth down drives and also committed heavy turnovers that ended up costing the game, and they ended up losing this game 28-12. Ravens would obviously continue to be a playoff team for the next couple years, but unfortunately, they would end up coming short in all of those years, and it seems like this is going to be one of those teams I fear that always has a great offense and a great defense, but they're just one of those teams that have a hard time winning the big one. They obviously did it a couple years ago against the 49ers in Super Bowl, but they really haven't done it since then. And I always wonder will the Ravens finally get it together and will they finally win it? Hopefully they do, but we'll see. 2001 St. Louis Rams. The St. Louis Rams were an absolute powerhouse in 2001 that featured some of the most electrifying talent in NFL history. Led by the greatest show on turf, they boasted a high-flying offense that struck fear into the hearts of their opponents and coached by one of the innovative minds of the NFL, Mike Martz. This offense was a well-oiled machine, led by the legendary Kurt Warner. This guy was a former supermarket stock boy, stock boy, and he turned into an NFL MVP. He also was led by Marshall Falk and also some great receivers in Isaac Bruce and Torrey Holt. Warner would end up passing the ball for over 3,000 yards, 26 touchdowns, and an iffy 22 interceptions. Marshall Falk would rush the ball for over 1,382 yards and 12 touchdowns, and he also had over 700 receiving yards. Torrey Holt and Isaac Bruce were a dynamic wide receiving core, obviously. They both had 1,000 yards receiving all together. Together, they were an offensive juggernaut, and they seemed impossible to stop. They finished the regular season with a 14-2 record. They destroyed the Packers in a divisional round and knocked off the Eagles in a five-point game in the NFC Championship game. This meant that they would then meet the Patriots in Super Bowl 36. And literally the Rams know they will be a part of history. The Pats would get out to a 17-3 lead thanks to Warner's two touchdowns late in the game. And then in the fourth quarter, Patriots had no timeouts left. They could have easily took this game to overtime. Brady being the most clutch player he is, would get the ball downfield and set the ball out at the Rams 30 yard line. Adam Vinatieri would then come out and kick the game winning field goal to help the Patriots win the Super Bowl. Unfortunately, this would mark the beginning of the end for a lot of things. The beginning of the Patriots dynasty, but also the end of the greatest show on turf as well. Warner started struggling with injuries and consistency, and eventually the Rams were released him two years later. Rams would not make it back to the Super Bowl until obviously 2019, where they lost to the Patriots, and honestly, a little bit of embarrassing faction. They didn't even score a touchdown in that game, but obviously in 2022, they would beat the Bengals and win another ring. 
2009 Indianapolis Colts. The 09 Colts had an absolutely stacked roster on both sides of the ball. Led by head coach Jim Caldwell, the Colts would pull off a 14-2 record, and Peyton Manning had an absolutely great season, passing the ball for over 4,500 yards, 33 touchdowns, and 16 interceptions, with a 68 completion percentage. He also had key contributions from guys like Reggie Wayne, who was a big part of the Colts' passing attack. He had 100 catches, 1,264 yards, and 10 touchdowns. Dallas Clark gave him an even bigger option as he also had 100 catches for over 1,000 yards and 10 touchdowns. They would have two units at defensive end. They would have Dwight Freeney who had 13 sacks and Robert Matthews who had 9 sacks. This team looked bound to make it all the way to the Super Bowl as he had talent everywhere. They would hammer the Ravens in the divisional round and then knock off the Jets in the AFC Championship game in advance to the Super Bowl where they would take on another legendary quarterback in Drew Brees. The Colts would quickly jump out to a 10-0 lead in the first half. However, in the second half, the Saints would take over, holding the Colts to only 7 points in the second half. Drew Brees would throw two touchdown passes, and Tracy Porter would get a pivotal pick six in the fourth quarter to help the Saints win their first Super Bowl in team history. That would be the last Super Bowl appearance for the Colts in the Peyton Manning era, as in 2010 they lost to the Jets in the divisional round, and in 2011 Peyton Manning would have to set out the whole entire season with a neck injury. Colts would be close a few couple of times, but we all know what happened a couple years after this. They met the Patriots in that controversial game where they lost 42 to 7 after it was revealed the Patriots were flattening some balls. So, yeah, you know how that went. The 2015 Carolina Panthers. The 2015 Carolina Panthers were a force to be reckoned with in the NFL. Led by head coach Ron Rivera and quarterback Cam Newton, they stormed through the regular season with a 15 and 1 record, with their only loss coming from the Atlanta Falcons, and that would earn the top seed in the NFC. Newton would be named the NFL's most valuable player that season, and he was the heart and soul of this team, showcasing his dual threat abilities. That season, he had over 3,837 passing yards and 35 touchdowns. He also had over 636 rushing yards and 10 touchdowns. But the Panthers also had contributions from their defense, who was led by Luke Keekley, who was one of the most dominant linebackers in the league for a while, as that season he had 118 tackles and 4 interceptions with 2 touchdowns to go along with it. In the playoffs, they would pretty much continue their dominant run. They would play the Seahawks in the divisional round, and they got out to a huge 24-0 lead. Now, the Seahawks would rally back, however, the Panthers would do just enough to win this game 31-24, getting some crucial stops and Cam Newton coming up clutch. Then next up was the NFC Championship game against the Arizona Cardinals. The Panthers left no doubt in this contest, dominating from start to finish and route to commanding a 49-15 victory. Newton will put on a masterclass performance in this game, throwing for 335 yards and two touchdowns while also adding two scores on the ground. Their defense also played a pivotal role, forcing seven turnovers in this game and two touchdowns of their own. This would then set up a matchup between the Denver Broncos and the Carolina Panthers in Super Bowl. Panthers look were riding high, and they were poised to claim their first Lombardi Trophy in franchise history. However, they ran into a formidable opponent in the Denver Broncos, led by that stout defense and Peyton Manning. And despite a valiant effort, the Panthers came up short in a hard-fought defensive battle, losing this game 24-10. Newton faced relentless pressure from the Broncos and struggled to find his rhythm, throwing for 265 yards, one interception, and he was also sacked six times. Since 2015, the Panthers have never really recovered from this loss. They made the playoffs one other time after this. However, they were just no longer that team once again that they once were in 2015. They never even got close to this team, as since then, they have been below 500 for the last couple years. And yeah, they have just been a really bad team for the most part. Now, what made it worse for the Panthers after this? Cam Newton had a hit on his shoulder, and after that, the Panthers were pretty much done. Cam Newton was not the same player, and that's why everything happened that's happened to this point where the Panthers happened. That one injury to Cam Newton that pretty much cooked his career that we all know and love. The 1990 Buffalo Bills. Ah, uh, if you're a Bills fan, click off this video. This might be a PTSD magnet for you. The Bills finished the 1990 season with a 13-3 record. Their dynamic offense was led by legendary quarterback Jim Kelly when he passed the ball for over 2,000 yards, 24 touchdowns, and 9 interceptions. 
His leading receiver was Andre Reed, who had 71 receptions, over 945 yards, and 8 touchdowns. They also had a dynamic running back in Thurman Thomas, who rushed the ball for over 1,297 yards and 11 touchdowns. One of the biggest adaptations the Bills made to their offense that made them so dominant was their no-huddle offense. Aka the K-Gun offense, and they found great success leading this offense. The Bills would also have a top 10 defense, led by the legendary Bruce Smith, who had an insane 19 sacks this season. They also had a contribution from guys like Cornelius Bennett, Shane Colin, and Darrell Taylor. As the playoffs loomed, the Bills showcased their medal. They took down the Miami Dolphins in the divisional round, setting a stage for an epic showdown with the Los Angeles Raiders in the AFC Championship game. In a display of sheer dominance, they clinched their victory in a decisive one at that, earning their ticket to Super Bowl 25. I'm pretty sure if you're a diehard Bills fan, you know how this is going to go. This ended in heartbreak. Super Bowl 25 was a clash for the ages, pitting the Bills against the New York Giants. Despite a valiant effort, they fell short in a heartbreaking 2019 loss after a missed game winning field goal. This would not be the end of heartbreak for the Bills though, as they will of course lose 3 more Super Bowls after this, and they have not been met to the big game ever since. On the other hand though, the Bills have their second best thing to Jim Kelly though right now, that's Josh Allen, and we'll see if he can be the savior for this Bills team, and can he finally bring a Super Bowl to the city of Buffalo, eventually. Now before I go any further, if y'all want me to do a part 2 on this, let me know some teams down below y'all want me to discuss more in depth, and let me know some teams I might have missed. But for the sake of this video, the final team I will discuss is the 1984 Miami Dolphins. Now the 1984 Dolphins might be one of the greatest teams to never win a Super Bowl, led by legendary head coach Don Shula, and also one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time, and Dan Marillo. They had an absolutely potent offense, and also a dominant defense during the regular season. Reno you know, would have an absolutely insane season, thrown for 5,084 yards and 48 touchdowns. He also had a great receiving core with the Mark brothers, Mark Clayton and Mark Duper, who combined for over 2,500 yards and 24 touchdowns. Tony Nathan would be a big part of the rushing game as he worked for over 700 yards and was also used frequently in the passing game as well. Defensively, the Dolphins were led by linebacker AJ Duway and defensive end Doug Banners, who earned Pro Bowl honors that season. Their defense ranked second in points allowed, showcasing their ability to shut down opposing offenses. In the playoffs, the Dolphins would cruise past the Seattle Seahawks in the divisional round, commanding a 31 10 victory. Marina win that game with throw for over 250 yards and two touchdowns. However, the train came to an abrupt stop in the AFC Championship game against the eventual champions, the 49ers. And despite Marino throwing for over 300 yards and a touchdown, the Dolphins would lose this game 38 to 16. And this loss would once again deny him a chance to compete for the Super Bowl title. And this is why, to this day, Dan Reem was called the greatest quarterback of all time to never win the Super Bowl. The Dolphins would travel back to the AFC Championship game after this with another chance to possibly win the Super Bowl. Unfortunately, they will lose to the New England Patriots. But look on the bright side, Dolphins fans. You have a stacked team now, and you still have one of the greatest teams of all time in the 72 Miami Dolphins, if that helps for anything. Probably doesn't, but I'm just trying to help. But anyways, that's gonna do it for this video. Let me know in the comments down below if you wanna see a part two on this topic, and let me know some teams I might have missed in the comments down below. And if you haven't yet, make sure you like this video, subscribe to my channel, and tap the bell icon for future football content, and follow me on social media it's down below in the description. And I will hope to see you guys in the next video. Peace, Twitter, X, whatever you wanna call it, Instagram. All that's down below in the description. But I hope to see you guys in the next video. Peace.